Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. We really thought that we had such competition with the other sessions that we said, well, maybe we'll get my five people. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. So, so this is moving from monolithic architecture to spring cloud and microservices. And just so you know, this is an hour talk. So we'll just go through instead of doing a break halfway through. So you know then you'll get out a little bit earlier. And if anyone has any questions, please interrupt and ask your questions as we're going along. So I'm Mary Ann Weyer, and I'm an architect at Premier. And I'm Travis Cherry. I'm also an architect at Premier. And you see that we have another name on the, on the slide, Eddie Escobar. He's one of our colleagues, but something came up that he couldn't make it. But we wanted to make sure he had credit, because he helped contribute to everything that we'll be presenting. So, so we'll get started. So this is just the normal legal stuff, don't worry about it, you're not going to read it. <laughs> you know? and, and this is the abstract, just to remind you, we're going to go through our journey. And we were a little bummed that at the keynote they were doing our basic idea, so they stole it from us to, to say the evolution. And we'll go in and how we evolved to Spring Cloud and then get in a little bit more detail how we're deploying it in our, our environment and how we're using Spring Config. So we work for Premier, and it's a public company that's group purchasing for hospitals plus an informatics. So I'm not going to talk about the group purchasing at all. We're on the informatics side. So we write software for hospitals, and we provide a service. They, all of our applications are web-based, so they come to us to get the data. We have 40% of the hospital patients across the country. So we have everything there is for in-hospital stays, what diagnoses they had, what outcomes they had, what was performed, what procedures. So we have a large database where we can analyze and see what's going on. And the mission for Premier is really to improve the health and to reduce costs. And you may think that reduced cost is, you know, hospitals want to save money, but what we found was if you reduce cost, that means that you've improved the health care of the patient. Reduced cost means better outcomes. So here's our journey. And really, we, I didn't put the, the amoeba phase, if you're thinking it, as evolution. Prior to this, we were 100% Microsoft Shop. Everything was Visual Basic, you know, just sort of what, like what the keynote speaker was saying. We, everything was, uh, was Microsoft. So we started our journey. And at Premier, we thought, you know, if you're going to do something, let's just do it. So everyone was Visual Basic people, let's move to Java. We wanted to have an MVC at the time. Struts 2 wasn't released. We didn't want to do Struts 1, so we went with WebWorks. WebWorks was sort of the precursor to, to Struts 2. We had Spring in there, but it was more of we heard that Spring was something good to have. I don't think we really used it, like we should use it, so, but we had Spring. We wanted to be able to be more than a Microsoft shop, so we had Dojo. We decided that Hibernate was probably something good to do. But everything was manual. If we had a lot of people on the system, someone had to go out by hand, build additional hardware, configure everything. There was no automatic deployments. So some of the evolutionary changes, now that we weren't doing everything in Visual Basic, we had frameworks. You know, Microsoft really doesn't have the open source framework. So Hibernate helped us a lot. We were able to generate SQL. We were able to map to objects. Struts was a big improvement. We had the JSP pages. And Dojo, you know, it was more object-oriented JavaScript. It was supposed to work across all libraries. We had our widget library. You know, things were better. And this is the application that we made. So what, what this application does is it allows hospitals to enter data to document what they did for a patient. And the thought process is, and, and all this data that they document has to be submitted to Medicare and um, a thing called the Joint Commission. So what Medicare could do, and they can look at this data and they can say, did you really improve the outcome of a patient? So it's, it's called evidence-based care. And gathering that information over the years since this started, it's improved the care so much that different measures have gone away. But in our little world of deploying this, everything is new. 
we put it out into production, we had issues, you know, that we'll go into more in the next slide. So the developers, it was very stressful for the developers. Everyone was putting in long hours, all this new technology, we really weren't sure where to look to find problems. And we had our yearly employee all staff meeting and they invited hospitals to come out and speak to us. So one of the chief medical officers stood up and said that this application helped improve the outcomes of like 2,500 health patients in his hospital, just one hospital alone. So it made the developers think, well, you know, all those hard hours, it was worth it. We really are doing more. We're, we're helping improve people's lives. But our lessons, we still, we had performance issues. We still had to deploy and bring things out. We found that we really didn't understand Hibernate. We were new to all of this, and Hibernate, when you don't know how to use it, creates really, really bad SQL. So we had so many performance issues with our SQL and trying to figure out where to go, how to tune it. Not all the developers even knew how to code with a JSP page. So they were sticking their Java within the page. So we, you really don't want that in your application. Dojo was hard to pick up just because of the lack of documentation. And hospitals are really slow with moving to things. So we thought, isn't this the most incredible thing? Dojo has a calendar control. You just click, you choose the day on the calendar, and you're good to go. Hospitals hated it. That was like one of our biggest things. We had to rush around to try to be able to create a control that they could type the date in by hand. So, you know, different things that you learn when you start getting feedback. So we're thinking, well, we have to improve. What can we do next to, to move in our evolution? So we didn't, we thought it's crazy. Why do we have struts and spring? We need to make it easier for the UI developers to do their work without waiting for all of the back end pieces to be done. We wanted the, the page to be more responsive right? instead of having to load a JSP page each time the user moved. We needed to figure out, we didn't want to throw Hibernate out, but we had to figure out what can we do to improve on Hibernate. And we wanted to be able to deploy everything automatically. So now we're in 2010 to 2014. 100% spring. We're still monolithic, but we created some services, like services that would just do printing. We still decided that Dojo's what we want to do. But we made this a single web page app. So now the web developers could stub out their JSON calls. They could work. They don't have to wait for the back end services to come up. And we created uh, Hibernate best practices to make sure that we were in front of what people were doing with Hibernate and not having problems. And now we're, we're using Jenkins. So now we can. We could push a button and everything deploys. So our advantages are the, the UI, they're not waiting, they're developing. We're more productive because people, it's not serial, people are more working together. The application appears to be more responsive because we're only updating portions of the page. We, we still have to scale by putting out additional hardware, but it's a push button. For the other app, our first put into Java, it could take two days to deploy everything. So now we're hours to do it. And this is what that app looked like. So in, in the medical world, just like you all get your yearly review, and it's you know what you're ranked on, and you get your yearly review based on some criteria, all doctors have to do the same thing. Theirs is a little bit more stringent that it has to go to different regulatories to show what they're doing. So this application is making it easier to do that year-end review with doctors. So they can look and see everything that they're being measured on, how they're improving and how they compare to their peers. So that's this. So our, our initial our lessons learned here was that it's hard to do a single uh, web page app unless you really understand JavaScript. You know, everyone says that Dojo works across browsers, but you're still gonna have some browser issues. 
it's a little harder to program in Ajax. The developers had to think a different way to make sure that they're getting partial results or how the, re the requests are coming in. So it, it was a, a bit of a learning curve. And we had cross-domain issues that we may be making an Ajax call, but we wanted to go to a different backend service that wasn't in the same domain, so we had to figure out how to hide that with the F5 so you know, the end user isn't getting any errors. And the first time you deploy and you're thinking, you know, all this great JavaScript and you didn't minify it, and it takes forever just to pull all that. So we had to learn how to do minifications and with Dojo, how you build those special minif minified, I don't know if that's a word, you know, uh, libraries. So I think, what should we do next? At Premier, we try to keep going. We don't want to stay with one technology. We, every time we do something new, we want to look at everything and figure out what should we do going forward. So we think, you know, for our user interface, let's make it more metadata driven. That come up and define a metadata that lets you know how to, what widget to put on the screen. We want to make it easier to write your code once and deploy it in different environments. So why don't we look at Spring Configuration Server? We have to be able, you know, every time you go to the doctor's office, they ask you to sign that PHI to say that do you approve us to send your medical information to your insurance company. So we have to track anyone, everyone who looked at any of your patient data. So we said, well, I think we should do that in an enterprise way and aggregate all that together. All of our other applications were run under JBoss. It's a pain to set up. So what, why don't we go to Spring Boot? Now we're just a self-contained container. We also have to be able to be up 24-7. So we have to be able to deploy blue-green deployment. It was a lot harder with the monolithic. It's a little easier now. And we wanted to try to move more towards the 12-factor apps. And I'm sure there's going to be lots of sessions on that at the conference. But here's just an overview just to see. And now, Travis. All right, so 2015 and uh, on into early 2016, we're about halfway there to the 12 factors. Uh, our code bases are all maintained in Git. Um, we're still using Maven. Uh, but that's okay. All of our dependency management works. At least it's not Ant. Um, we, um, because we're using Spring Boot now, uh, you know, all of our configuration isn't going to be uh, embedded in some sort of a JBoss container. Uh, so we've got to externalize that somewhere. So we decided to use a Spring Cloud config server. Uh, we've transitioned to Bamboo from Jenkins uh, for doing all of our continuous integration, and we're using Canary files for blue green deployments. And if you guys don't know what that is, the basic idea is that our F5 is kind of constantly pinging uh, each of the application servers that we have running, making sure that it's up. And as soon as one of those canary files is removed, which is just a simple static HTML file that returns a 200 when it's requested, if that goes away, then the F5 says, okay, this node's out, so I'm going to stop routing requests to it. We can deploy to that node, then we can bring it back in service, and then do the same for the other nodes. Uh, we've really worked on trying to improve our DevOps processes because this is new for everyone and we need to make sure that all the teams in our organization um, are okay with the new types of things that we're doing and that everyone understands this new process. Um, we're still making sure that, of course, the code that we're deploying into dev is the same code that we're deploying into production, with the only difference, of course, being the configuration. Uh, and like Marianne alluded, we're, we're hoping to move more towards doing this metadata-driven UI development. Um, and then lastly, we need some sort of an enterprise logging solution because since we don't have JBoss anymore um, and we have these containers floating around, we don't necessarily have a fixed place for our logs, so we need to make sure that we can get those out of those little Spring Boot apps and saved in a consistent location. So um, some of the advantages of kind of where we've moved over that time frame were that we've established these best practices and we have so many new projects that spin up. I swear every week there's some new team starting a new project that I get pulled into meetings for. And uh, outside of not ever really being able to accomplish real work, um, we have at least done a great job of kind of standardizing on our architecture and um, making sure that we're leveraging the same frameworks and we're using the same versions of those frameworks and that everyone's inheriting from a single master POM file that has all 
all the dependency management in it. So, you know, when we're all on Spring Cloud or Spring Boot version whatever, and we say we're going to take the jump to Spring Boot 1.4, everybody can do that together once they're ready to kind of bump their version of that master parent palm. Um, and, you know, we've also got these kind of consistent things where um, this one team has solved a problem that these other ten teams needed a solution for, so they're all happy to jump on board, contribute to it, and start leveraging it. Um, and like Marianne said as well, we're, we're pretty much container ready at this point. Um, you know, in order to be container ready, your apps, you know, can't rely on any sort of, um, you know, JBoss having data sources defined and all this kind of stuff. So we needed to make sure, like I said, that we have our, our configuration externalized and that we can uh, potentially update that configuration live without having to wait for, um, you know, server restarts and potentially having any kind of downtime during deployments. Um, and in terms of UI development, uh, because we're constantly constantly evolving and we're just constantly rolling out these new products, we needed to be able to move quickly. And with our previous process with using Dojo and, you know, we did define these kind of common components that our user experience team said, hey, here's a data grid and here's a bar chart. And we would implement these components and then each team could build their kind of monolithic apps or their single page apps pulling in those components. But there was a massive amount of code that we still had to maintain on the UI side. and. Good JavaScript devs are pretty hard to find, and uh, the consistency in the in the products was just not there. And we often had nightmares in other browsers when we'd go to IE8 and make sure the stuff still worked. People had never even checked it, and it's just a disaster. So, um, you know, we really needed some way to kind of expedite that UI development process while still maintaining that consistent look and feel that we want to have across our products. So uh, this is a new product that we're in the process of rolling out. This is called Provider Performance. And what this is, is um, kind of a hybrid of the previous product that Marianne showed um, called Physician Focus. And it's not only pulling in data from the inpatient side, so on the hospital, physicians have all these metrics that we're evaluating them on, you know, like how long their length of stay is, how much each case is costing on average. Uh, but there's also all these measures that they're getting evaluated on in their doctor's offices when they're just seeing patients on a daily basis. And there's really no one place that they can go to look at all of that. Um, so Premier actually acquired a company uh, a couple of years back, and they actually had all that data. So now we've basically created this integrated product where we're pulling all of those measures together with all the inpatient measures and showing it in one place. Uh, so this is kind of our current uh, Spring Cloud application architecture. And when I say Spring Cloud, I think that term should be um, considered to be very loose because this is not an ideal Spring Cloud architecture. I see a lot of cameras coming up. Don't go home and build this. <laughs> um, so really kind of the main things that are working here are uh, we've moved to microservices so you can see we've got you know three different microservices that we've pulled out uh, you know we have provisioning stuff where you know anytime a new user gets added some service gets called that user gets added into the application team's database and given some permissions when that was actually bundled up with our single web app it was such a pain because you know we have to deploy this app when this provisioning team makes changes and there's no reason that those things should be coupled together so it totally made sense to pull that out let it be scaled and and just kind of maintained independently um, we have admin apps where, you know, hospital administrators who are kind of coordinating how their users are interacting with our systems, um, they can go in and define all that through a different web app. So we've externalized those services into a separate uh, little Spring Boot app. And then, of course, the little the microservices that we use for our, our uh, typical web app. Um, and like I said before, we've created kind of this common library of widgets, uh, but now we've wrapped this metadata approach around it where rather than having to have these teams wire up all this JavaScript code and all these event listeners and all this other crazy business, all they're doing is through metadata saying, I have a view, it has some widgets, this widget gets its data from here, and then when you click this, this happens, and so on and so forth. Um, and we're now using Spring Cloud Config Server, and this is probably one of my favorite things at the moment because it's so powerful in what it can do. And we've just externalized all the configuration for all of these different components out to Spring Cloud Config Server. Um, and that's backed by a Git repository. There are other options for what you can use uh, to back it, but in our case, we're using Git, which I think is the preferred method. Um, so when each of our apps starts up, it's basically checking in with the Spring Cloud Config Server saying, hey, I'm so and so, can you give me my config? Um, and then, you know, of course, because right now we're still using this kind of dated non-cloud infrastructure uh, where we have just fixed VMs that we put in a ticket and say, I have a new product going out, 
I need four VMs for this thing. They need to be, you know, this much CPU, this much memory. Um, and then we are essentially just stamping out this whole infrastructure and just pasting it, you know, across each of those VMs. So this is really just kind of a stopgap until we have better infrastructure in place. It's actually real cloud infrastructure where each of these things can kind of be running independently. And I'll show you a better picture of what this should look like um, in a little bit. So again, this is just a disclaimer. We are really only halfway there. We're just ready to get there. We're not there yet. Um, so some of our current challenges is that because all of our configuration just sits in a Git repo, um, the way that our Git repositories are set up internally is that if you are on a team um, you know, that owns this or whatever project, I can commit freely into that Git repo. You know, I can just push things into master and nobody cares. People may care, but I can still get away with it. Um, so we needed basically these separate repos that our DevOps team could control. Because we don't want somebody going and pushing something into this production Git repo um, that's going to affect our live app. And the next time some instance starts up, some guy just accidentally pushed something into the wrong branch and suddenly our app is all jacked up. Um, and we needed to have some chain or some process around that where um, you know, maybe it's a pull request model where we, you know, do a pull request into the master branch and then our DevOps team approves that pull request as a part of um, And then and you're, what you're using this configuration for is oftentimes sensitive information. So, for example, your production database. Um, we need to have all of the, you know, usernames, passwords, and pools and all that kind of business configured in there. Um, and we don't want to just stick raw passwords in Git because anyone in our organization can go check out that source code and take a look at it. Um, so pretty much anything that's sensitive needs to be encrypted at rest so that if you just go look at it, it doesn't matter. Um, and then of course, um, config server itself needs to be secured uh, because one, when we're communicating with anything internally, of course we have to do all that over SSL. Um, but two, because when you you know, running in production, it's going to respond back with that what was a, an encrypted database password and it's going to decrypt it and hand it to you and say, here you go. So if anyone were just to call that REST API and say, hey, give me this config, they could get our production passwords. So we need to make sure that no one can just kind of on a whim call that and that it's secured with some sort of, at a minimum, basic auth. Um, and then Spring Boot Actuator, which we heard about a little bit during the keynotes this morning, um, has all these really great endpoints. You know, it can allow you to restart your app and um, you know, do health checks and see all the beans that are kind of in the class path and just all this great stuff. But that's not something that you just want anyone being able to see and anyone being able to access. So we really have to kind of control what we want to expose there and then make sure that that is also secured. Um, and then, of course, uh, we needed to figure out how to automate Spring Boot deployments because normally all we do is just have Jenkins or Bamboo take some WAR file and just plop it over somewhere in JBoss and then, you know, it scans and sees there's a new version of that file and auto-deploys it. But that's not the same with Spring Boot. So um, just kind of some suggestions on securing Spring Boot apps. Um, Spring Boot's awesome in that it will just find these dependencies on your class path and then provide some sort of default kind of implementation um, just because it sees that. So in the case of security, if you put the Spring Boot Starter security dependency on your class path, then suddenly your app has basic auth enabled. You didn't even ask for it. You just put a thing in your POM file and suddenly you're now getting asked to log in. It's really cool. Um, but the default implementation is not perfect. You still have to go and update that um, and harden it a little bit. So for example, it's going to give you some just default password that you need to go in and override that password value. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's all these different endpoints for Spring Boot actu Actuator. Um, so my kind of go-to is to just disable all of them by default and then just whitelist the ones that we want. So in your config, you can just say endpoints.enabled equals false and everything is turned off. And then if I just say endpoints.info.enabled is true, then that means everything but info is going to be disabled. Um, and you can also turn on the sensitive flag just to basically say all these are sensitive endpoints. Uh, and same thing for the management endpoints. Um, if you just say management.security.enabled equals true, now you have security over all of those management endpoints for your Spring Boot apps. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want anybody going over HTTP. Everything has to be SSL, even if it's internal traffic in our building. Um, you know, these are just kind of standards that our compliance team is enforcing, which is great stuff. You know, there's no reason that we should, should be doing anything different. Um, but when you do configure SSL for these guys, you want to make sure that you use a different key store for each of them. 
Um, and then as well as you know these endpoints for the actuator and for the management, um, you want to make sure that someone can't just go into production and just start guessing you know whatever your actuator endpoints are and just hitting you know slash refresh or slash whatever because um, you know that could potentially allow someone um, externally to try to make changes or jack up your app. Um, so you want to make sure that you kind of map those to a different class path so that um, you know what your F5 or whatever your kind of external firewall is exposing uh, will block any requests to those uh, potential or those endpoints. So for config server, there's some additional things that you need to do um, in particular. And um, config server, when it does this encryption and decryption of passwords and things like that, um, that requires uh, an additional library in your JVM to happen. There, it's this Java cryptography extension, it's JCE library. You can get it from Oracle, but you need to grab that and you need to drop that into your Java installation on your servers. Um, otherwise, that stuff won't work. Um, and then, of course, you have to generate a key store for the config server and then specify all of that information um, in encrypted format. And then your config server has to connect to your Git server to get your source excuse me, for all of your configuration. Uh, so what we prefer to do there is just to use the SSH public key for those two guys to communicate together. Um, as far as encrypting sensitive configuration values, um, config server has endpoints slash encrypt and slash decrypt. So when you start up your little config server Spring Boot app, you can just hit this endpoint, assuming that you've installed that JCE library, you can pass it a password and it will encrypt it for you and hand it back to you. And then if you have an encrypted password, you can hand that to the decrypt endpoint and it'll give you the, the uh, decrypted value. Um, but we don't want to just say, okay, dev team, here's the prod database password, enjoy, encrypt it for me and stick it in your source. Uh, there has to be process around this. We need our DevOps teams to be the ones that kind of own that. And at a minimum are the ones, you know, supplying those passwords, calling those endpoints, getting the encrypted values, and then potentially they can hand off the encrypted values to the dev team to put into the configuration or they could just do it themselves. Um, when you put this in your configuration, you have to prefix it with Cypher, and that's what tells uh, the config server when that configuration is being requested by a consumer that it needs to decrypt it on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the way out. So just kind of a disclaimer, this is not a comprehensive list of everything that you need to do to, de to, to secure uh, Spring Boot and Spring Cloud. I don't want to get blamed for anything, uh, but there's a lot of great references on, on the Spring Docs. So, um, right now we are using Bamboo to deploy everything and um, to deploy Spring Boot apps there's a couple of things that we had to figure out. So um, the first one is that um, you know we need to get that JCE library out there in our Java installation so we just use Puppet to do that, configure Java and drop that additional library in there. Of course if you had a container docker hopefully more on the uh, PCF side um, you can easily configure that as a part of that container. Um, and then, you know, there are certain variables that we have to have Bamboo inject um, for our Spring Boot app. So, you know, what's the location of our key store, what's the password for it, and things like that. And again, these are all things that our DevOps team goes into Bamboo and configures for us. And they put in the, um, the encrypted values so that even if a dev team were to go in there and try to see what that value was, they're not going to see anything meaningful. Um, and when you start a Spring Boot app, you literally just say java-jar, whatever the app name is, and then the thing starts up. And then if you keep that console window open, you can hit control C and it kills it. Um, but you know, when you have a bamboo agent doing this for you, um, you have to make sure that you can get a reference to that guy when it comes time to deploy a new version of the app so that you can kill it first. Um, so all we did for that is just use a little shell script inside of bamboo um, to basically write the process ID to a file, save that process ID so that when we come back in and say, okay, I want to deploy a new version of this, it can actually remove that uh, I'm sorry, kill the process and then put in the new one. Um, and then as an additional part of that, with our blue-green deployments, uh, the way that we have it working is that that shell script will basically remove the canary file, wait a little bit of time, just have a sleep so that our F5 can get the memo that the server has been taken out of the mix. Then it kills the process, deploys the new one, puts the canary file back, waits a bit for the F5, and then we've basically achieved kind of a no outage deployment of our Spring Boot app. So 
Config Server, like I said, it, it is one of my favorite little toys lately, and um, this whole concept of metadata-driven UI is a perfect fit for it. So when we first went down the road of doing metadata-driven UI, we were doing it inside of our monolithic apps. So we had a war file, and you know, inside of the web INF directory, we dropped this metadata JSON file that had all the metadata for our app. But it meant that every time that we wanted to change any of the metadata, we have to redeploy the entire war file, which seems silly because it's just configuration. So why not pull that out and put it in config server? And config server does now support JSON files, so we're good to go. And of course, the kind of native support is there as well for YAML and properties files. Um, and config server has endpoints for consuming configuration. Um, they're very easily or very well documented, and it's basically just saying, you know, I need this app name, this branch, you know, this label kind of thing, and it'll give you back all of that configuration. There's a couple of really cool annotations that we found ourselves using a lot lately. One of them is at value, and all you have to do is just say, you know, above some, you know, private whatever string, um, say at value and then in quotes the name of the property. And what this will do is uh, when that bean is instantiated, um, or I'm sorry, when the app starts up, it'll actually grab from config server or even just your application YAML uh, whatever property value that you're referencing and then inject it into that variable. Um, it's really cool, but then what happens when those values need to change? All you have to do is annotate that same bean with at refresh scope um, and then that allows us to hit this refresh endpoint, which is just slash refresh, and that will tell um, you know, all of those at value annotations that they need to check and see is there a new value for that property, and if so, grab it and dynamically update that running bean without a need for restarting anything. Um, to trigger the refresh process, it's just basically a RESTful call to the slash refresh. Yep, yeah, and we can have Bamboo do that through our shell script, uh, just you know, basically doing a curl to that endpoint, and that'll trigger the refresh. So, um, as you saw today, there's this really cool annotation called at configuration, um, and that's where you know, if you've previously had all of your config in XML, you can move it into a Java class um, and annotate it with that configuration, put all of that um, config in there for your application, and then on your uh, main application class, you just annotate it with that Spring Boot application, um, and in the case of Config Server, which is just a Spring Boot app, there's just one additional annotation to say at Enable Config Server, and suddenly you have a working Config Server. It is literally like one class, two annotations, and you are done with Config Server, and then you just go put your configuration out there in your Git repository. So um, to get into the metadata-driven UI a little bit more, um, you know, we've, we've kind of iterated a lot with our UX team and come up with these patterns for widgets and views and um, you know, different screens and you know, different patterns for seeing the details of measures and things like that. Um, so uh, we're able to essentially represent an entire user interface uh, with metadata. No JavaScript code at all entirely metadata driven, you know, five different screens, drills and filters and all this kind of stuff, all metadata. Um, and we basically created this kind of client-side MVC framework um, that's primarily just built with jQuery um, that will parse that metadata um, and then it will render the appropriate screens um, and, you know, it's basically an app. So. Um, our client applications at this point hardly have any code in them at all. It's only any custom code for that particular project because there's this common library that's reading their metadata, it's instantiating all the widgets, it's wiring up all the event handlers, um, and all they had to do was provide their metadata and then override any app-specific functionality. So, you know, there may be some occasional JavaScript code here and there, um, you know, images, CSS that they might want to override, but by default, all of their application is driven through this configuration. Um, and we even created a WYSIWYG editor that we can use to go in and essentially generate that metadata. So we can visualize, you know, here's a view, and then this is, you know, a chart widget on this view and another widget, and this is where its data comes from. And we can modify all those values, and it gets persisted into that JSON file. And then what we did was we took that JSON and moved it out to config server. Um, so all we have to do is basically commit whatever changes we've made into config server, hit the refresh endpoint, and we can make kind of massive changes to our application without changing any code, it's just configuration, and we've not even restarted our app, and it suddenly looks different in production. 
So I'm going to show you a quick demo of what that would look like. So first thing I'm going to do is start up my config server. So this is just a very kind of vanilla Spring Boot app that is a config server. Um, and I can show you if I can pull up the right window. This is our entire application for config server, just two annotations. Um, and then we've got a little bit of configuration in our application YAML that talks about um, basically where our config lives, which in this current case is just a local repository uh, running on my laptop. So um, I've got config server started up and running on port 8888. Um, and now I've got an application um, that is using this common framework in the metadata um, that is going to get that data from config server. So I'm going to start this guy up. And I've got this little shell script run locally sh. All it does is basically specify, it builds the code, specifies the, uh, the current profile, which is a local profile, um, and then runs the jar. So our Spring Boot app is started up, and we're good to go. So I come into Chrome, and I already had it running. Didn't mean to ruin the surprise, but here you go. So very simple app. Um, this is a provider demo. This is all completely fake information. Um, this is just showing for Dr. A. Smith over the course of a decade how many patients he's seen each month over that time frame, um, the different payer types of those patients, um, where, they, where those patients came from, um, and then essentially the trend of these payer types that we're seeing up here. So let's say that our uh, business has said, you know what, we don't like line charts. We're doing stacked area charts from now on, and we need you guys to go make that change. Um, so all we have to do is go in and change our metadata to uh, change this guy from a line to an area chart. So I'm going to come in here, and this is my metadata JSON file. Um, I'm not going to get into everything that's happening in here. Um, but this is our time series that we see down there. It's grabbing dummy data, which we call a fixture. It's just a JSON file, rather than hitting some real service endpoint. Um, and the chart type you can see here is a line. So I'm going to change that to an area chart, and I'm going to save it. And for the record, this is my config repo. So this is basically the configuration that my uh, config server is reading, and that is what was served up to this app and how it looks the way that it does. And there is absolutely no custom JavaScript or Java code in this application. It's just reading this configuration and then using our common framework to render itself. So I've made that change, and I come back into the app, and nothing has changed, right? Because I just made the change, but I haven't actually told my app that I want it to refresh yet. So I'm going to come over here, and I am going to add that, and I'm going to commit it. So oops, you can see I'm good to go. Um, so I've just committed the code at this point. I still haven't told my app I want to refresh. So still, no change. But all I have to do is hit this endpoint. So localhost 8443 provider demo, that's my context path for my application, then slash refresh to tell it I want it to refresh. Before I do that, I want to just point out, um, when the app started up, you can see it retrieved. I, we just put a little uh, logging output to show that it grabbed the metadata from the config server URL. So this is actually the REST API that config server exposes where it goes to slash provider demo, which is my application name, slash local, slash master, slash provider demo dash local dot JSON. Um, so it grabbed that JSON, and that's what it's been using. But you can see each time that I've refreshed, um, it isn't doing that again. If I do it one more time, again, it has not hit that config server endpoint again. So I'm going to hit this post. And you can see some stuff has happened here. So now when I refresh my app, suddenly this chart looks very different. Um, and if we go back and look at the logs, you can see that it has once again read that configuration. So now we have this cool area chart that we can start looking at all the different payer trends over time. So that's 
high level idea. This is obviously a very simple use case, but these applications can you know, be very complex, have multiple screens and a lot of functionality. So being able to drive development on the UI side this quickly really allows our teams to focus just on the hard part, which is the data and the API layer. So let's jump back into this. Uh, I am basically telling the application, um, my actual dashboard app, I'm hitting the refresh endpoint of that because that is who has that bean with the refresh scope annotation. So I'm telling him that I want all those beans with that refresh scope to update and then they know, okay, we need to go talk to config server again and get our um, latest configuration. This thing is being difficult today. All right, there we go. So some of our lessons learned, like I mentioned earlier, um, with config server, you can't just go dropping this into some public repo that anyone has access to. You have to make sure that it's access controlled um, by your um, DevOps team or whoever, just so that you can't have random committers changing your production configuration. Um, and then for data sources and any other sensitive values, make sure that you encrypt all those values at rest. Um, and there are going to be a lot of process changes. This is going to be new to people, so you're going to really have to get your DevOps team on board, bring them in, have the pivotal folks to help get everybody in a room together, kumbaya, um, it'll be good. And uh, as far as Spring Boot goes, um, you know, like I said, there are some challenges in getting it set up for the first time and just making sure that you can start it up, you can monitor the process, make sure that it's still running. Um, and because you don't have that JBoss infrastructure anymore, um, you know, we have to deal with how do we uh, configure our data sources, what ports are we binding to, how are we going to keep them from conflicting, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and another thing is just, you know, with Spring, the magic is awesome, but sometimes it can really piss you off because you don't know why it's not working or why it's doing something that you don't expect. Um, the, in, one, in one case with us, our app would not connect to config server and we could not figure out why. Um, but it turns out it was just because we were missing a dependency on the class path and of course without that it can't do anything. Um, and then, you know, this transition to the Java-based configuration. I really never had as big of an issue with XML, um, but I think the Java config is much nicer once you get used to it, but it really kind of takes a minute to get your head around and there's going to be all these weird startup issues that you're going to be banging your head on the wall for a while just to get through. So kind of where we want to go from here is to actually achieve all these 12 factors. Right now it's kind of silly because we've got all these Spring Boot apps and this cloud ready stuff, but we're still sticking it on VMs and anytime we want to add another VM, I have to put in a ticket and request it and get everything set up and it's just a pain. You know, we do at least have the bamboo infrastructure to be able to push button and deploy all these things so we can get it relatively quickly, but still there's a lot of manual process. So this is where Pivotal Cloud Foundry comes into play. Um, and honestly, I think we were, when we proposed this talk many months back, we thought we would be much further along at this stage than we are. And really the only reason that we are not is because um, in addition to getting to play with all this new cool stuff, we still had to build and ship products. So of course business priorities seem to override sometimes. Um, and, you know, another thing is we have these apps and these, our business folks are saying, man, this is going to be probably the number one used app that you're going to see and there are going to be thousands of people on this thing every day and we put it out there and there's crickets. And we've got all this hardware that we're just wasting sitting there and there's no reason for that. So of course, there are huge operational savings in having um, this more fluid infrastructure that can spin up nodes as they need to be used and kind of monitor um, you know, how many of those we need and start them up and kill them off. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that we can have each of our little microservices scale independently. So our provisioning service, our admin services versus our UI services, you know, one of those is going to be hit much more heavily. It's probably going to be the UI service if something takes off and starts being used really heavily. Or, you know, if there are certain times of the month where we have um, you know, reporting deadlines or things like that and our users are really becoming active. Um, we want our applications to be able to scale up, but we don't want to have to dedicate um, and and then because of microservices now, we need some way to fail gracefully. One thing goes down Um, so there's a really cool 
um, kind of component to the Spring Cloud infrastructure called Circuit Breaker, um, which essentially lets you fail more gracefully in those situations and kind of define what you want it to do in the event that this thing is. Um, and there's even a dashboard, which essentially kind of lets you monitor if the circuit opened or closed and how many requests are going through and how everything is going. So kind of more where we want to head, where of course we have the Pivotal Cloud Foundry platform um, that is kind of managing all of these um, containerized things. So rather than having a dedicated VM, each of these things is spinning itself up as it's needed. Um, and you know, of course, because we have all these new services, uh, I can't keep track of all these things, and we don't want to have to know how many of the, you know, the admin services versus the UI services we have running, so we're going to use a service registry, and uh, part of the, the Spring Cloud infrastructure is this Eureka service registry, which essentially when every one of these guys starts up, they check in with him and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, I'm you know, running on this port, remember me. So then when somebody says, okay, I need a UI service or I need an admin service, they come to the service registry, and he says, cool, I got three of those, you can have this one. Um, and then, of course, um, to kind of easily route requests and map, um, you know, incoming requests for UI to the actual UI app, we're going to have some sort of a router in place. And there is a thing called Zool, which is another part of the whole Spring Cloud Netflix um, infrastructure that can do that for you. So uh, there's still a lot of challenges in getting to this kind of sweet spot because, you know, from a DevOps standpoint. Um, they don't like relinquishing control and just letting the app teams kind of have as much control over their own destiny because it makes them nervous that we're not going to do it right. Um, so that's where uh, the Pivotal team comes in. And uh, as you've heard before, with all of these success stories with Comcast and these other companies, um, they've been very, very successful at you know, getting organizations acquainted with their technologies, with their process, getting everyone on board, and really streamlining things. Um, and then, you know, of course, some of the other challenges are just budget cycles and business priorities, like I said, and that's why we are where we are right now, because there's other work that we've had to get done in the meantime. Um, and then, you know, lastly, you will meet some folks that are diehard Docker fans and other kind of factions in the organization that think they've got the golden ticket, but uh, what they need to realize is that, you know, it's not one or the other. We need to really understand where these kind of technologies are kind of best and what their sweet spot is and what use case is most appropriate for each one. Um, and also to understand little things like, you know, Docker can actually run on PCF, so you can still have the best of both worlds. So um, I think that's pretty much it. Are there any questions? A couple. Um, so I mentioned Kubernetes in there, he asked, and uh, we do have a team that is internally exper experimenting with that, um, and they have um, kind of a running version of it. Um, but again, it's not apples to apples, and I think that's the big thing there. And you know, we are kind of in the process of just doing a little bit of um, knowledge transfer and working with those guys to um, expose them to some of the capabilities of all of the PCF stuff, because they think it's really just the same thing. So there's a lot more to it that they need to understand. Uh, so his question was around version management for microservices. Um, so I mean, one of the simple approaches is that with your microservice, just part of the URL could be you know slash v2. So then when the app is calling that, it knows that it's hitting slash v2. Um, you can also do that through configuration and config server, so that you can easily update that. Um, but then you can, you know, in order to maintain kind of backwards compatibility, have multiple versions. Yeah, we, we basically try to make changes kind of 
non-breaking and you know just if we're adding new methods great um, and we can roll that out and everybody can still continue using those same APIs but it's kind of a similar concept to what you're doing or if you're trying to do um, you know no outage database deployments where you implement um, kind of all the non-breaking changes you know you're not renaming columns you're not renaming parameters things like that um, you're just adding on to it um, and exposing additional methods so um, that's basically the concept it's it's not uh, I don't think there's any real secret sauce to it. It's just trying to maintain what's there and then slowly evolving and making sure that you kind of define, you know, cutoff dates for, you know, we're going to have a major release and this is no longer going to be supported. So we can actually look at all the consumers of that API and make sure that they're aware that by this date they have got to update their code and get to the new versions. Uh, so the question was, how do we control security over who can see what? Um, we have, um, you know, provisioning APIs where, um, you know, when a user is added into our system, um, you know, for the provider performance dashboard, for example, we're saying, okay, so and so is an individual provider. Um, therefore, this person may only see their own profile and only see their own performance. Um, so then, on the UI side. Um, our metadata is actually filtered based on what roles that person has. Um, so, you know, based on what they're provisioned for, you know, they're essentially just rows in our database saying so and so has this role and this role and this role. Um, and then when our metadata is returned, um, L or chunks of it are kind of removed if that person doesn't have the necessary roles. Um, but of course, you can't ever rely on your UI to be kind of the source of truth and the security. All of the back end services always have to validate. Um, that you know whoever's requesting this information actually has access to it. Um, so you know same thing again with the provider performance app. We have a different role called a lead, and when they come in, they can actually see you know not just one cardiologist but all the cardiologists, and they see a roll up of here's all of cardiology and how they're performing. Um, so same code base, but based on you know who logs in, they're seeing two very different things. So all that is role based, and again all the back end services have to um, you know verify that you know this user is or does have access to these services um, and you know we have a security layer in place that does our single sign on um, and you know controls all that for us and maintains all the sessions as well Yeah, that was just a lazy diagram on my part. Um, we do have multiple application databases um, for this particular one. Yeah, just blame it on laziness. Yeah, for high ability of the config server, um, you know, we're doing the exact same thing that we do for kind of load balancing requests to our application services. We just have multiple instances of config server running, um, and then you know our F5 can help route requests across those instances. Yeah, uh, the config server can be containerized. In our case, it's not yet because you know we're not running in a containerized environment. But yes, it is a Spring Boot app, so it is very containerizable. And you know, all of the um, data for it is you know residing in a Git repository or wherever else, so it's not you know any environment-specific information embedded within the app. Um, and another thing to remember with config server is that um, it's only being used on startup and refresh. Meaning, you know, your app's not constantly bugging it, saying, you know, what's this value and this value. It's just when it starts up, it gets the config, and then if you hit the refresh endpoint, it's going to get it again. But beyond that, it's just kind of hanging out. Uh, when you hit a new page, as long as you know it's the same application, you know, like if I have a Spring Boot app that's got 10 pages in it. Um, when that Spring Boot app starts up, it's making its request to config server and getting the configuration. Beyond that, it's not. Um, 
It's really not too bad because, you know, we don't have massive amounts of config, you know, we're not talking 10 megabyte files or anything here, we're just talking a couple of K, so it's not too bad. And again, it's just on startup. Um, and since we have multiple instances of the apps, we can afford to let three run for a while while the fourth one is, you know, starting itself up and we're waiting for the canary file to get recognized by the F5. Yeah, his question was, uh, how easy is it to debug when we have all of the metadata living in config server? Um, and as you could see, when I was running locally, um, my config repo is on my laptop. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we actually created this little WYSIWYG editor that um, you know, shows us our metadata. Um, so we actually have some config in there where just for local development, if we set an environment variable, it's going to point straight to that file in that repo. So as soon as I hit refresh in the browser, um, I don't even have to bother hitting the refresh endpoint on the config server. It's just reading that file straight from wherever that environment variable is pointing. So it makes it much easier to debug that way because it's literally just, you know, refresh, grabs a new file, and we can see the changes. It is true, yeah. Yeah, um, as far as kind of our deployment pipeline, are you curious about just this app or just the bigger picture across all of our apps? Uh, so the way that we do it now in Bamboo is, you know, once a build completes and we have, you know, our little jar that's built, it goes into the repository, um, and then we create a release out of that guy. Um, and then with that release, we can hit a button and say, deploy it to dev. Then click a button again to deploy it to QA, and so on. Um, and then when we want to go to production, it's just another button press to go to production. Um, and typically, what we need to do for that is have, you know, a scheduled change that our DevOps team is, you know, going to be in charge of doing that, um, just, you know, from a compliance perspective. But we're actually in the process of empowering the dev teams to be able to click the button themselves, because why does this guy have to click the button? Why can't I click it? We've already tested it across all the environments. I'm not logging into servers. I'm not doing anything. I'm just clicking a button. It's a predictable result. The only thing that's different is, you know, it's servers over here instead of over here. Right. That, that does get challenging and, you know, so far the way that, you know, we, you saw those three different microservices for this app. There's kind of a larger team that is still, you know, even though there are separate pieces of that team that are building each of those components, they're still kind of an integrated team. So there is communication and coordination around, you know, we're going to have a release, so we need to make sure that this stuff is out there. Um, we can, we do have multiple versions where sometimes we'll use, you know, our dev environment for this really early on stuff and our QA environment for this other stuff. Um, and as far as testing goes, you know, we do have a lot of automated testing with Selenium where, you know, we're calling, you know, pulling up our application and actually having it, you know, click through and do everything. I mean, we have API testing too where it's essentially hitting all of our endpoints and making sure everything works. And these things run on a nightly basis as well. Sure. I don't know who you pointed at. <laughs> question was, are we looking at other options than uh, the Pivotal Cloud Foundry platform? Uh, and like I mentioned, there are these kind of competing groups in Premiere that have used Kubernetes. We're thinking of those as more of like internal apps that we're not as, you know, they're not as visible, they're not as highly available, um, and that this, the Cloud Foundry platform is something that would be better for prime time, high available, or high, highly available. Um, and really critical applications. Um, so, you know, I put the um, TBD on there just because, you know, from a legal perspective, I don't want to suggest that we're, you know, definitely doing this or that. Um, but 
I would say at this point, you know, from my perspective, I think it makes the most sense. Um, Right now we have a pretty painful process of you know non-prod and prod patching weekends where everything goes down and you know there's days of downtime over the weekend and things like that and it's um, that would be much alleviated with that infrastructure in place. Sure. Um, sorry, I saw a hand up over. Sure. Yeah, I'll let Marianne talk about enterprise logging. Um, we're using, you want to come to the mic just a minute. So we're using the ELK environment to, uh, and, and what we found is that we're going to either Logstash talk to RabbitMQ, or the application could talk to RabbitMQ. And then we have a listener that's pulling everything off of RabbitMQ and putting it into Elasticsearch. And then with ELK, you can a you're able to review and look at the logs. And for our compliance logging, we created a set JSON attribute structure that we wanted, so it's easier then for the person, the compliance officer, to run queries and see. So we have a registry of app code, so we know that this app code always means PPD in that example. And everything is locked down because in this case we're logging PHI data, so we have to have security that no one could look at anything that's in Rabbit. No one can get into Elastic and look at anything. <laughs> you know, I was kind of hoping that somebody was going to ask that because um, I've been one of the primary folks working on that. And, uh, you know, with large companies, open sourcing things is always a challenge with our legal teams. But we have absolutely talked about it. And uh, I think if I keep pushing, once it matures enough and once we're able to at least kind of have a successful open source implementation internally, um, that that could be a more realistic possibility. But thank you for asking. Yeah, unfortunately at this point the demo code is not going to be available, but I may be able to go throw some stuff in GitHub that doesn't necessarily have the proprietary uh, framework embedded inside of it that would be uh, very similar. So far, that, that's really worked. We just say, we promise you it's coming. You know, and your developers, they don't have to do anything because the framework is going to do it for them. Yeah, and oftentimes we've we started to see a little bit of that open source model internally um, just happening where developers from these teams that need these things and are waiting on us to actually pitch in and help and contribute back. So that's been really successful and helps expedite those new features. Uh, well, we have a platform architecture team of how many? Six or eight people. Um, and then uh, specifically for kind of this dashboard framework and that whole metadata-driven piece, there's really only three or so 
dedicated resources, but like I said, there are um, folks across the different teams where there's really kind of one or two people embedded in each of those teams that's kind of an expert in it that contribute back and help work on it kind of in their free time. And the, the product teams range anywhere from, I don't know, maybe four or five up to 15. So basically, we run into issues with having multiple environments that we have to serve with our Git repo. Um, the way that we've done it is we actually have two separate ones. We have kind of a prod repo that we're just using for our production stuff and then a non-prod one. Um, so we kind of segment it that way where um, you know, at least we know all of our really important stuff is over here and then all the stuff that the devs can screw up is over here. Um, so that's really helped, I think, it's just two separate versions. Yeah, you know, it, it can be interesting to see how these microservices kind of end up splitting themselves out. And sometimes, you know, you feel like you're just splitting out code for the sake of splitting out code, and then you just got this extra maintenance that you've got to deal with. Um, that example, you know, it's just one example for this particular product where we had these separate pieces, and it just kind of made sense. Other products, um, you know, we have kind of different modules embedded within them that aren't, you know, admin versus non-admin, but, you know, different components of the product. So it makes sense to have separate services for those. But I think the, the best way to think of it is that if there's something that would make sense to be able to scale independently um, and also to have maybe a dedicated set of resources supporting it, um, you know, apart from something else, if you can split that off, then that makes a pretty good uh, justification for it. So I think we're running short on time. We've got time for one more question, and then after that, we can hang out outside. Sorry. Well, thank you guys very much for your time. We really appreciate it.